I'm Film Scene Programming Director Rebecca Fons, and I want to welcome you to this virtual screening of Making Waves, The Art of Cinematic Sound. This film is presented as part of our Science on Screen program, and Science on Screen is an initiative of the Coolidge Corner Theater with major support from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. Stick around after the film. We have an incredible conversation with seven-time Academy Award winning sound designer Gary Rydstrom and University of Iowa music and film professor Nathan Platt. It is a conversation about sound design, but it's also a conversation about the power of cinema. And there's some really incredible tidbits about Gary's experience as being a sound designer in Hollywood for over 30 years. So definitely check it out, stick around afterwards. The conversation will start right after the credits for the film. So enjoy the show. Okay, well, hello to our virtual audiences. My name is Rebecca Fons, and I am Film Scenes Programming Director. I want to welcome you to our Science on Screen post-screening discussion of Making Waves, the Art of Cinematic Sound. This film is part of the third year of Film Scenes Science on Screen program, which this year will present five total films, including a virtual screening of Metropolis, presented in partnership with the National Czech and Slovak Museum and Library, in partnership with their exhibit, A Century of Robots, from Chopek to Now, and the film Coded Bias, which will include a virtual conversation with the film's director. You can find all of our Science on Screen programming and our virtual offering info at our website, which is icfilmscene.org. I am super excited to introduce our moderator and our guest for this conversation uh, for After Making Waves, The Art of Cinematic Sound, partially because I'm a huge fan of this film and I, I think it's a buffet for film lovers um, and I'm excited for the conversation with these, these folks, but also because as is the case with so many things in 2020, our best laid plans for an in-person presentation of the film was scheduled for this spring and had to be canceled. So I'm very happy that we can still make it happen virtually. I wanna thank Making Waves director Midge Costin and producer Bobette Buster for their help making the film access possible. And of course, I wanna thank the Science on Screen team. Science on Screen is an initiative of the Coolidge Corner Theater with major support from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation and Film Scene is honored to be a recipient of this grant again this year. So that's all my business information. So I'm going to introduce our moderator and our guest and then I'm gonna scoot out of the virtual way so you, you guys can have the conversation. So first, a welcome to our moderator, Nathan Platt, who serves as the producer and co-host of Film Scenes Podcast and is a professor of music and cinema at the University of Iowa. Platt's publications explore film music of Hollywood's studio era from a variety of angles, including the collaborative process of film scoring, the intersection of technology and music, the role of studio orchestras and soundtrack albums. Platt's books include Franz Waxman's Rebecca, a film score guide, and Making Music in Selnick's Hollywood, which investigates the scores for films like Gone with the Wind, Since You Went Away, and Spellbound. And then I'd like to welcome our guest and Making Waves subject, Gary Rydstrom, who is a film director and sound designer. For Pixar Animation Studios, he directed two shorts, the Oscar-nominated Lifted and Toy Story Tunes Hawaiian Vacation. For Disney and Studio Ghibli, he directed the English language, ver English language versions of The Secret World of Arietti, From Up on Poppy Hill, and The Wind Rises. At Skywalker Sound, he has designed and mixed many films, including Terminator 2, Jurassic Park, A River Runs Through It, Toy Story, Quiz Show, Titanic, Saving Private Ryan, Star Wars Episode I, Punch Drunk Love, Finding Nemo, War Horse, and Bridge of Spies. He also wrote and directed the feature film Strange Magic. He has won seven Academy Awards for sound and sound editing and career achievement awards from both the Cinema Audio Society and Motion Picture Sound Editors. Gary is a native of Elmhurst, Illinois, Midwesterner, and, graduate, and a graduate of the University of Southern California School of Cinema. Nathan and Gary, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Rebecca. And thank you, Gary, for being here. It's, it's a real uh, honor to get to talk with you. Oh, this is gonna be fun, thank you. Yeah, um, so in the movie, we learned a little bit about your backstory, especially how you came to work with John Lasseter at Pixar, but I was wondering if you could Start by t expanding on that a little bit for us. What drew you to working in, in sound on film? And also, if someone wants to follow your footsteps, where do they start? <laughs> well, I, I've, it, it turns out that my, uh, my career path was a little uh, unpredictable. I, well, I grew up in Elmhurst, Illinois, and I actually, I remember uh, getting films from Blackhawk Films, which is from Davenport, Iowa. I could get Super 8 films. At the time, they were all silent films. So my love of film started by watching silent movies, Buster Keaton, Charlie Chaplin, Laurel and Hardy. So then I went to film school to make, you know, my version of silent films, 
did everything at USC Film School, including sound, got a job in sound at Lucasfilm in 1983. And, uh, you know, that, that's how I did sound. I, I went into this as a visual medium and came out as a sound expert. So one never knows where you're going to end up. That's, that's really neat. I, and what, what led to that first job uh, at, with Lucas? Well, I, I, I went to undergraduate at USC and I was really scared to go out into the world because the film business is really hard to get a job in. And so I stuck around as a graduate student. And then finally, Ken Mira, who was a professor of mine at USC, who was a famous professor there because he had maintained a friendship with George Lucas. Mm -hmm. So George Lucas's company at the time, anytime they were looking for a good but cheap <laughs> student to come work at Lucasfilm, they would call Ken Mira. And he had recommended Ben Burt in the, the mid-70s to do, who ended up being the sound designer on Star Wars. So... Uh, come 83, for whatever reason, they called up Ken and they said, who you got? And since I was the guy who never left, he, uh, uh, and here's where my Midwest upbringing came in handy. I asked Ken Mira later, why did you pick me of every, for everybody to, you know, at USC to get this job? And he said, because you were unassuming. <laughs> so love my, my superpower was I was unassuming. So there you go. Um, and so, yeah. <laughs> So Ken recommended me, and I started at Lucasfilm's uh, sound department in uh, 1983. Wow. And so at that time, was Ben Burt working there still? And were, did you work with him? Or was that, how, did, how did you kind of pick up the skills in sound design? Uh, uh, ben Burt was, you know, Skywalker Sound was then called Sprocket Systems. And it was very small. Mm -hmm. um, ben Burt was the, the, you know, sort of the, the founder of that part of, of Lucasfilm, the sound part. So he was definitely there, definitely doing work. And I, I would watch him work and worked on various things. Um, and it was a small enough group that I got to do every aspect of sound from fully recording, fully performing. I remember fully performing on Willow, um, uh, recording sound effects for Ben, seeing how Ben worked. So he was a real mentor. And I, my career, when the opportunities I got Ben was obviously very famous and very hot at the time. And so a lot of my opportunities came um, from people wanting Ben. And then they, were, they would say, Ben's not available. And then it would you know, say, here's this guy, including Pixar. So the first, uh, I did Luxo Jr., a short film for Pixar. And that's really because Ben Burt uh, wasn't available. So Ben Burt was both a mentor and it was good that he was too busy to take on some of these shows that I got. Right, yeah, that's great. Um, so the documentary mentions how filmmakers in the 30s and 40s got some ideas about sound from radio, and then in the 50s and 60s, studio techniques and pop music were also an inspiration for sound designers. And I'm just wondering, like, across your own career, are there other genres or other sources of inspiration, like, outside of film that have affected your work? Well, I think, um... Uh, it is true. I mean, some of the earliest sound movies that were good for sound, like Citizen Kane, people came with a radio background. Um, and I think when I was, you know, the two things when, you know, growing up in the 60s and 70s, you know, film, film and music were equally kind of powerful, important. So the Beatles and, and that kind of, you know, let's be honest, the revolution number nine and that kind of introduction into the whole music concrete idea where you could make interesting musical things out of sound effects or sounds that weren't necessarily music. Walter Murch, I know, talks about it in the movie. He was very, uh, as a sound designer, very uh, uh, influenced by music concrete and uh, used that really well in his career. And, and you know, to an extent I was too, it was, it was fun to hear what people could do. You know, the, the, the music world in the 60s and 70s was about production, about doing things in the studio Mm -hmm. uh, led by the Beatles and Pink Floyd and others. They were doing really curious things with sound. So I think, you know, the, that world was going up. But the other thing that was true, I, w I got a lot of influence from music or from movie sound because in the, set, in the early 70s, uh, sound for movies was really great. So, you mm -hmm. know, Ben Burt had done the Star Wars in 77. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, uh, there was, you know, The Exorcist, the Friedkin movie, The Exorcist, really brilliant use of sound. Coppola's uh, early movies, Martin Scorsese's early movies, 
Um, you know, David Lynch had done Eraserhead, uh, <laughs> movies like that. And then there was this awareness, I think the movie talks about it, but there was awareness of sound in the early 70s that was uh, very exciting for people who are interested in film. Yeah, it seems almost like there was an expect, a sort of growing expectation that as opposed to sound just being sort of something that, you know, if you don't notice it, it's doing its job to something like where we're expecting these more sort of overt gestures to really kind of for us to, as audiences to like really be aware of it, to go, oh, wow, like, you know, the helicopter started over here and it ended up over there kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. It, was a, it, was, it was a time, again, yeah, the audience is becoming more aware of sound too, and because there was stereo, but also movies like, uh, Apocalypse Now and Star Wars and, and uh, uh, Eraserhead and, and uh, um, all that jazz. And there, there were some movies that really pushed the boundaries of sound. So, um, and driven also by uh, filmmakers who were willing to experiment. And so if you're a filmmaker that's looking to experiment, you're kind of looking around for all the tools you can use to experiment. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just sound, they were experimenting in all sorts of ways and included um, use of, of sound, you know, so uh, it was good sound in that era came about because the directors had a, a, a an amazing amount of freedom and a willingness, willingness to experiment that helped us. Mm -hmm. That's neat. So the Making Waves really emphasizes the collaborative uh, dimension of arranging sounds, especially the fact that this isn't just done by one person. And I'm wondering, like, how does that play out for you in your work? Like, do you, at what point are you typically brought into the process? Like, are you working really closely with the director or do you get a rough cut and just go to work? What does that look like? Well, ideally I'd like to come on early. And I, you know, for some movies like Jurassic Park, I came on before they shot anything because there was things to talk about and uh, images to look at. I mean, I love looking at the production art for a movie and seeing where they're going with that. Um, so, if the movie has the budget and the time, I try to come on early. Uh, and I'll be one of the first people in the sound department to come on, but eventually we have a whole crew with uh, sound effects editors, dialogue editors, Foley performers, Foley editors, and then mixers. So it, it grows as it goes. Um, and the whole sound design title, which kind of was introduced by Walter Murch and Ben Burt in the 70s, People were trying to use it to say this is, even though there's a crew of sound people, there is a person in charge of the sound of the movie. Mm -hmm. uh, I tried to take that as a uh, as an approach to to doing it. But yeah, the, the film. What's fun about film is that it is collaborative. It's, you're never really alone. You're mm -hmm. always having to work with somebody. You have to bounce off ideas. You have to sort of you know, you, you, you gather ideas and then, you know, the director's job is to kind of filter and funnel all these different ideas from all sorts of people and then end up with a coherent film. So uh, that is, it, these days with the whole, you know, distance working that we're trying to work through, one of the things I miss most is literally being with crews and with people. And uh, I, I I find that much more creatively satisfying than sitting in a room alone trying to say, like, write a book. That's very hard. Yeah. Um, amen. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm curious about with music, do you, do you kind of get together and coordinate with the music team at all? Ideally, too, it's nice to do that. A few times I have. Most of the time, to be honest, the music is, happens in a separate world. And then we don't really hear it until the final mix when all of our elements come together. Mm -hmm. There have been some cases where our, on the Pixar films, they would invite me to be part of the early spotting sessions. I remember sitting in, with the director and, and at that time, Randy Newman or mm -hmm. Michael Giacchino or someone. Yeah. And one of the important things with music, which is why I liked being in these spotting sessions, is where the music is, where it starts, where it stops. Mm -hmm. That's almost as important as the music. Um, so I like being part of that. I, I, I remember sitting in spotting session for the first Toy Story and I would suggest, you know, in my arrogant, fairly young at the time way, wouldn't it be great if this section here had no music, the sound effects could really take it, it's, you know, Sid's toys under the bed or whatever the moment is. And then Randy Newman would mock me mercilessly. So, oh, sure, no pretty music so we can hear the crinkle of a newspaper or the, you know, the, the snapping of plastic. People really want to hear that. Um, but it, it, you know, so 
with the right collaborators, with the right filmmakers. And John Williams has been great to work with uh, because he uh, he's open to um, you know knowing what we do on the sound effects side and uh, on Jurassic Park. He was able to hear what we were doing with, with sound effects and dinosaur vocals, and he took that into account as much as he wanted to for how he orchestrated the music. Um, I did the weirdest example, if anyone wants to go back and look at Punch Drunk Love, the music score by John Bryan, which is brilliant, yes. incorporates sound effects literally in the music that we gave him, and then we incorporated themes from the music in the sound effects. So the two, I've never done a movie that so subliminally meshes music and sound effects. There are moments in that movie where the sound effect um, plays essentially the theme, one of the themes that John Bryan writes for the for the score and there are moments where we give him sound effects from like the harmonium tape, harmonium tape rips and things and he puts it in the score. Um, anyone who is interested in doing film or sound or music more integrated, the yeah. better. Yeah, no, I'm so glad you brought up that example because that's a film that really does stand out. I mean, the just the whole, the soundtrack and by that I mean, yeah, everything, the effects and the music are are brought together in these ways that that really stand out like I can't think of any other film that I've watched that's like that and, and sometimes the music is mixed really high as well which I'm sure was was planned and was um, part of that that sort of special coordination so it it, it kind of it, yeah you sit up and you notice it differently and it, it all comes down to Paul Thomas Anderson the director of that movie that's his doing it's not something we don't add our ideas for a movie on top of the movie so it comes from the director mm -hmm. he wanted that movie that movie illustrates something that I think sound does really well, which is that um, it can it can tell a part of the story that you aren't necessarily seeing, mm -hmm. whether literally being off screen or psychologically off screen. And Punch Drunk Love, the soundtrack, the John Bryan score, and what we're doing with these kind of burbling weird sounds, mm -hmm. you get a sense of the Barry Egan character is ready to blow at any moment. Mm -hmm. So the sound is saying what's in his brain. The the visuals are actually very beautiful. It looked like a Technicolor MGM movie, right? Yeah. Yes. Primary colors and the flare, lens flares. It looks beautiful. But the sound, the music and the sound effects is saying inside, he's a very disturbed and angry person who could blow at any moment. So to me, that's a very, that's a very Hitchcock approach to sound or a Kubrick mm -hmm. approach to sound, which is tell one part of the story with the sound and another part with the visual and together they tell you something really amazing. Yeah, no, and that goes back to your point again about these directors in the 70s really sort of seeing sound as, as an opportunity. And I wonder to what extent too, it's, it's both an opportunity and, and maybe also an exercise in trust. I don't know how it is for sound, but I know in music, and actually Hitchcock even mentioned this, being somewhat insecure about like what a composer would do with their film because they, they kind of can't, they, there's so many sort of specialized skills that go into it that they can't always necessarily articulate exactly what they want and the composer brings something back and they have to, they have to decide if it's close enough to their vision. And um, I'm wondering if it's similar with sound. Oh, well, it's definitely similar. I think, I think directors probably, they'll talk about it with composers. It's so obvious that music has an intense effect on movies. Mm -hmm. And, um, um, so the communication between director and composer is really important, and uh, um, there's it's not any different. Sound effects, ambience is what I do, which is not music, but it's sound. To me, sound has an emotional impact, music or not. It's always right. an emotional. I'm trying to go back to that emotional. Making waves tries to make that point, which is what I love about that movie. It's not about the technology of sound effects, mm -hmm. sound work. It's about the emotion. Yes. Um, so. Uh, that means that it's powerful. So yeah, you have to you have to rely on your own instincts to do it uh, so that it's appropriate to the movie. But I, you know, like a composer, I rely on the director to be the to be the the the, the sounding board, the and the final mm -hmm. filter that says yes, this works for the movie. Yes, it doesn't work for the movie. And there's plenty of times I try kind of crazy stuff, and then the uh, the uh, uh, the director will pull me back. But yeah, it's it's. But it's all like, same thing with music. It's all, it's hard to talk about when directors and, and you know, and Steven Spielberg doesn't know how to write music, but he's able to talk to John Williams about emotional things he's looking for. That's what you talk, that's the language you should use yeah. is, is what emotion you're going for in a movie. And then my job is like everyone else in the movie is trying to help that. Yeah. 
Um, so you have worked as in both obviously many live action films and then also with, with Pixar and some with uh, Studio Ghibli. And I was curious, not, again, just not knowing as much about people who work in sound, is that fairly common that people go back and forth between those formats? And in your own work, is there something especially distinctive or that, that you like about each of those, each of those uh, formats? Well, I, I think animation, there may be some people that specialize in doing animation sound, you know, back in the old days, you know, Carl Stalling was an animation composer and Treg Brown was an animation sound effects guy and Jimmy mm -hmm. McDonald was a Disney animation sound effects guy. I, I loved doing both and I got to do both because Pixar grew out of Lucasfilm. Mm -hmm. So the first shorts that I did for Pixar and then the feature they did was from people I knew at Lucasfilm that became Pixar. So that was my, my way in. And it was b even better than, I tell sound people all the time, the animation is the most fun thing to do sound for because you are literally doing everything. You have to put in every detail as much and you have more control. Control is always a good thing. So uh, sound for animation is a freeing, creatively freeing thing to do. But, and I, my first animation I did sound for was computer animation at a time when computer animation was brand new. So it felt different to me than a traditional, abs more abstract Disney hand-drawn animation film, which has kind of a floating uh, emotional, uh, more direct, abstract kind of feel to it. But the Pixar films had weight and reality. And, uh, and so uh, I enjoyed trying to find a, a a sound for those movies that harkened back to the fun of animation sound, but had the reality of computer animation. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so it was fun to kind of explore what new sounds there could be. But I, I love animation um, sound is still, uh, if you're looking to have uh, more creative freedom as a sound person, animation is where to go. Mm -hmm. Are there any instances where your work in animation has has maybe changed your approach or given you ideas in live action where you might not have done that if you hadn't worked in animation? I think what it gave me, I mean, you work in animation, you work, it's, it's, I always think sound editing, sound mixing is about rhythm almost more than anything else. So, cause sound happens over time. So rhythm's really important, I think. In being involved animations about rhythm so uh, it's just you know the comedy of it the emotion of it is all comes from a lot from but a bump 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 so i think that i gained probably a little more um kind of instinctual uh listening for rhythms even in live action films than i would have had i not done some of the pixar films early on mm -hmm. yeah so um Technology and cinema and especially film sound is always changing, it seems like, at least from, from, a, from an observer's perspective. And certainly over your career, it has changed a lot how sounds are recorded, how they're edited and mixed into the film, then, and then how they're shared. Like, what's the sound system in a theater? What are people hearing at home? <laughs> how is it going to sound on their phones? And so I'm just wondering, can you tell us a little bit more about how those changes affect your work? Are there developments um, that you're especially excited about? Do you find that you have to sort of think across formats more as a sound designer? Well, I think going backwards in time, what's happening now is I used to uh, talk about how much I loved when DVDs came out and home theaters came out. I, I loved how people could listen to to our mixes or to our movies in a way at home that approximated the big theater experience. Um, and I hope that that's, I don't know how broad, broadly that's accepted in the world. Now that it looks like we're going to watch movies uh, via streaming more than we might in, in theaters, uh, I, I hope that, that the sound of the, the theatrical way of listening to a movie doesn't, doesn't diminish. Mm -hmm. uh, and people get used to watching. I mean, we always are afraid of people listening to our work on phones. So, um, yeah. so you have to think that way. It's like the uh, the old music, you know, George Martin would want to know what a Beatles song sounded like on AM radio on a beach. You know, you have to think mm -hmm. that way. Um, 
but you know we've we've gotten over the last few years with Dolby Atmos and all these new digital formats, we get to the point where the theatrical sound experience can be wonderful and big. Mm -hmm. So we make use of that, putting things overhead and around the theater and making it bloomy. And um, so I I really hope that doesn't go away because that's a nice to have that as a tool. Mm -hmm. I feel also lucky because I worked in this in this industry at a time when it was di digital came along after I started. So. I got to appreciate both what digital technology could do uh, and then make use of the early, you know, we literally would cut on, on mag, on, on mm -hmm. that magnetic tape, you know, one sound effect or line of dialogue at a time and string them up on these big bulky machines in a huge machine room and hit play and then mix on a big clunky board. So a lot has changed on the technology side for us producing soundtracks we, and gives us much more control. Mm -hmm. And uh, the first thing that happens every time you get an improvement in technology is the first things you do with it are terrible because <laughs> you, have, you have too much control and there's no limitations. You know, creativity is great to have, you know, some sort of controlling limitation so you don't just kind of go crazy. Yeah. So, you know, all of us had to kind of learn, well, now we can do pretty much anything, but we shouldn't. So yeah, right, right. technology is a, is a wonderful thing, but it, you, you, you got to... You got to hold back. Yeah, you still have to have the ideas, right? That the technology isn't going to do that for you. I, I liked the part in the movie where you were talking about working with the synclavier, which yeah. was kind of it seemed like a, uh, a sort of digitally enabled um, uh, sort of hybrid of musical instrument plus sound effect machine. And I, I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit, like, how did you? especially because you said that you sort of came more from visual uh, visual um, thinking of film visually as opposed to sort of through sound and music. How did you come to work with that? Do you still use that um, when you're putting together your, your work? I still use it. It's, 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 it the, the company went out of business a long time ago. The technology is very ancient. It's 80s technology now. So I need, there's pretty much one person at Skywalker Ranch I, where I work who is gutsy enough to try to fix it. <laughs> um, but there is a, there's a tactile, it was made for music. It was a, it, it was a sampler, originally a, a, a way of sampling any sound you could input and then putting it on a keyboard. Mm -hmm. Then you can manipulate the samples. And it was meant originally for music, but I found it useful for um, sound effects. And this is mid eighties. And Skywalker Sound was uh, forward thinking enough to buy one, um, they were very expensive, uh, but you could do that kind of work no other way. So, and it became completely key to a lot of the way I did sound, which I learned from Ben Burt. Ben Burt would make sounds for Star Wars, say, by having often a four track tape recorder, mm -hmm. and he would put different sounds on the different tracks of the four track tape recorder and pitch them differently. And, play them backwards or whatever, and then mix them together. And they were, you know, you know, freezing carbonite or a, a mm -hmm. tie fiber. Um, and I would do the same thing on the Sinclair. Just you know, one key, I could have layers of sound on the key and I could manipulate the pitch and the, which sounds they are. So I could play one key. And so I did the dinosaurs in Jurassic Park was I would find elements to make a T-Rex or a Velociraptor or a Brachiosaur and then place it on a keyboard and I could create a vocal and then perform it in a musical way. So you could actually, with a pitch wheel, you could make a rock and soul sing, you know, whoa. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I, uh, I, and there's nothing, all the youngins tell me that everything, all this new stuff is just as good or better than Sinclair, but you know, I'm an old dog and ain't gonna learn new tricks. <laughs> I like, I like the Sinclair. Yeah, well, and you mentioned, I mean, I think the tactile dimension is really important. And, and what you were just sort of, you know, showing there reminded me also of, of like the, the images we see of people doing Foley sound. And you mentioned that you had done Foley work as well, like in films like Willow and that sort of sense of like seeing something and reacting to it in real time and doing something that kind of corresponds to it, I think is really important. It gives it, again, that kind of, that sort of sense of meshing sound with, with, with something physical. Yeah, it's a performance. A Foley is a performance and you're watching a movie. There was a time when people thought now with digital keyboards, we could put a left foot and right foot and just perform Foley like this. But it turns out, and it's one of the things I love about sound, sound needs some of these old fashioned ways for it to sound right or to sound organic or to sound real. 
you sound human. So yeah. Foley's job is to sound human. You know, you're picking up glasses and rubbing your leather jacket and walking up and down stairs. There's a human element to that you can add to the yeah. to the movie. And um, uh, you know, it's a um, you know, it's it, I like the performance aspect of it and the tactile element. And a lot of the technology is going away from that. Um, uh, the Sinclair, what I do like is it's a keyboard with knobs and buttons. And a lot of that gets replaced with computer screens. Same thing with, if anyone's a, you know, like a, into sound mixing. Sound mixing used to be faders, knobs, looking up at the screen. And now it's kind of morphing into, you sit at a computer screen and you volume graph and you, you type. Yeah. But I'd rather perform. You know, and I, I think a lot of it's, 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 that's why it's similar to music. It's a performance. It's not, it's not typing. Right. It should be a performance as much as possible. Absolutely. Yeah. No, when it reminds me of, um, you know, going back to the silent era where, yes, I mean, people would be performing along with the film and sometimes you'd even have, you know, live, live sound effects, you know, for that, that, that would need to be you know not it, it was more than just dropping it in at the right time it was a it was a way of again kind of like making this two-dimensional image really feel like it has space and, and presence so well, your, your university of iowa which is renowned for rick altman's work which was you know talking about how important sound was to silent movies which we kind of forgot about but yeah, yeah you know both live music and sound effects were performed i think about audiences used to the kind of the intimacy of having a performance of the sound part right there in the room with them. Yeah. In some ways when we put it on film, we have to we have to get that same excitement, but we're not mm -hmm. in the room with you, right? How do we right. and, you know Ben Burt, who is still just both a, a genius sound designer and a historian of sound, uh, Paramount hired him to uh, put some sounds for the anniversary of Wings, which was made as a silent movie, won the first Academy Award and um, but Ben did on stage, they did a, a screening of Wings and he had a whole, he recruited people on stage to create sound effects on stage in sync with the, I remember they used typewriters for machine guns. It's not like, oh, wow. <laughs> they had fans for the propellers and they'd stick things in the fan for the propeller going crazy. And yeah. it was, you know what, we missed that. That's a, that, that kind of that live, and that's, that's why I think it's still important for me to do at least performance so it has the life that that has. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm curious, do you feel like working in film sound changes the way you listen outside of film? It does, it makes everyone in films, if you're a sound person, it makes you a little weird in the world because you sometimes stop listening to someone and start listening to like the furnace tick over in the okay. yeah. <laughs> and it's interesting and kind of drift away and go, well, that's cool. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, you listen in a, in a different way. And then I, as again, something I learned from Ben, I think, and the, the story I remember him telling us that he heard he was in an air show and he heard a, a certain type of airplane that made the screechy sound that he always remembered. He had no way of recording it at the time, but he remembered it and he tried to emulate it when he created the TIE fighter mm. sound in Star Wars. So he had a memory of a sound and he, and he used that memory to create a new sound. So wow. whether you can record it or not, it's, it's very useful to be aware of the world, both in terms of trying to be able to recreate what reality sounds like. But what I, what I like about sound design is I'm always looking for sounds that are around me that I can steal from the real world and use for something completely different than a movie mm -hmm. and, and then and turn it into something unique for the movie. So a, a secret to sound design is, is separating a sound from what it really is and then using it in the context of the movie in a unique way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I imagine there are, there's kind of thinking of sound as, as almost like a musical score where it's like, this is, you think about it in, a, in its totality in terms of what, what it's bringing to the story. But I'm curious a little bit off of the point that you were just making where certain sounds just jump out at you and you think, hmm, maybe, maybe I could use that at some point. Do you have like a, a, a top three or do you have a certain sounds that you are especially proud of where you go, you know what, that, I will always remember that one because putting that together was just really neat. <laughs> well, I, I, uh, 
I, there's some sounds I just record in the real in the real world that I use over and over and over again that I love. One was I remember driving my Saab at a high speed on a highway and then just opening up the the sunroof and it made this kind of vacuum <laughs> sound. <laughs> yeah. And there was such a cool sound that I went back with the recorder and drove you know on a highway as fast as I could get away with and just kept recording this. <laughs> thing of and I've used it for helicopters landing and and uh and Hercules there's a wind titan the Disney animated film Hercules and when the wind titan punches you it's my sob sunroof <laughs> um, yeah. you know use it for I when I listen back to old movies of mine I hear that sound all over the place I find places for it because it just has this explosive airy quality that I love mm -hmm. um then I and I'm just proud of weird ideas like there was a revolving door at a bank that we re I heard pushed backwards accidentally and it made this squealing sound with the grommet that then I thought would work great for ghosts and Casper. So I went back to the bank and pushed the revolving door backwards and makes this howling sound. Oh, wow. Um, you know, it's in those kind of um, sounds just become... Uh, and then my dog, I've, I've recorded my, I've had three dogs, recorded all three dogs and used them for the most, uh, this is the most mundane thing you can think of, recorded dog, but um, uh, I was very proud of, in Terminator 2, I recorded my puppy at the time eating a, a one kernel of puppy chow and that resonant crunch in mm -hmm. Terminator 2, the T-1000 turns his finger into a spike and it goes through the eye socket of a guard. Uh, and that sound is really my puppy eating. Oh so my goodness. It's, so it's a context, it's a context issue where you're, you know, in reality you go, oh, what a cute, my puppy's eating. But in the context of Terminator 2, it's horrific. Right. Another example, as I recorded for River Runs Through It, we record a lot of fly fishing sounds and rivers and fly casting. And mm -hmm. there was a sound in that where the, the fly line goes over a, a river and when it gets r ripped off the top of the river, that watery rip I used in Saving Private Ryan for the bullets going underwater and killing people. Uh, so when River runs through it, the same exact sound, you go, oh my God, it's so pretty, Brad Pitt is fishing. Mm -hmm. And then in Private Ryan, it's, oh my God, these poor guys are getting killed underwater. So yeah. context is all. Wow, that is, fascinating and really powerful I, I mean it's it also just really illuminates again the, the the whole creative dimension of this too the ability to sort of hear in a sound its vast potential for a variety of different situations and what what it can bring to those so wow. yeah, when, I, when I was a student at USC we were all very thrilled that Ben Burt one of our alumni had done Star Wars and that we had heard that he recorded the back of one of our projectors for the hum of the lightsaber. So we would, you know, students in you know, this is 1978, 79, we just go to that room, turn on the projector and just listen to it and go, oh. amazing. it's the lightsaber. So, um, you know, a lot, of the, a lot of my thinking comes from uh, Ben's thinking that way. That is so neat. And now I feel, I feel like we need to have, um, we need to have these, uh, these oral histories with, with all sound designers because your car and your dog and like all of, the, <laughs> all of these really, really interesting sources that I, you know, I don't think anybody would know unless, unless they ask. So, I mean, on that note, I just want to thank you, Gary. This has been a fantastic conversation. I'm so glad that you were able to join us. Thank you for your, your work through your career. Thank you for, your tremendous contrib contributions to making waves. Well, thank you. It was a pleasure to talk to you about this, and I'm glad that people got to see the movie. I'm proud of that movie, too. Mm -hmm.